So when you look at the issues that we have, right, um, a lot of it comes down to, to some extent, a lack of collaboration between the two players, uh, the two big players in the ecosystem, which is policymakers and practitioners. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Moonshot by Tech Cabal. <laughs> So amazing and very, very knowledgeable people about the realities of infrastructure across, the con across Nigeria and the continent, um, and of technology and technology ecosystem and how it's developed. So the minister has just walked us through his agenda. Oswald, I know you and I discussed it quite extensively, and I know that you've done some work and some thinking around this. So there are a few planks. There's digital, uh, there's uh, policy, there's infrastructure, there's trade. Which of these areas feels most critical to you? From your experience, and uh, Juliet, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to start. From your experience, in moving Nigeria forward, in moving Africa forward, what feels like the most important sort of next step? What, what do we need to win in? Thank you very much, Tomiwa, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So, you know, it's, um, first of all, it's great to hear the minister talk about the strategic blueprints and a few critical pillars and when we think about building the digital economy, actually, it's really difficult to single out a particular area because there are many things that need to um, be front and center for us to have a thriving digital economy. And I'll just highlight four very quickly. The first is access. And it was great to see infrastructure as one of the pillars in the uh, minister's strategic blueprint. Uh, blueprints, because that's the starting point. If you think about the digital economy as a marketplace, you need access to the market. And at the moment, broadband penetration in Nigeria is about 48%. The national broadband plan that was created to cover 2020 to 2025 has a target of 70% broadband penetration by 2025. A lot needs to happen for us to get there. And that's the starting point, so that's a cool piece. Um, and then, of course, it's important for you to have uh, content, locally relevant content. So making sure that you know, we have use cases, uh, tools, platforms, solutions that address the various gaps in the market. We've seen a rise in e-commerce, fintech, but we need to encourage a lot more growth and development, you know, edutech, agritech, health tech, you know, situations where technology is used to address key problems and gaps in the market. And those use cases speak to the demand, they stimulate demand. So for you to have a vibrant digital ecosystem, you need to stimulate demand so that there's more traffic right, and there's more use for the, the bandwidth. Uh, the third is really capacity, and the minister talked about this as well, and that's from two perspectives. So one is just making sure that we have people, you know, developers that have the skill set to build the applications and the solutions that I was talking about, and then the other is just making sure that uh, people are able to use these solutions. And the final is just funding. Um, uh, for our entrepreneurs. We've, uh, we've seen a growth in funding to entrepreneurs, but we're, it's still single digits, right? We haven't crossed the $10 billion mark so far across Africa. And if you compare that with the US, at the end of last year, um, investments to tech startups in the US was over $100 billion. So, you know, these are all um, pillars that are really important to be um, you know, to be spinning for us to have comprehensive and sustained growth. Oswald, um, policy is obviously the place that you started most recently, but I also know that you spent over a decade doing a lot of infrastructure work and a lot of building. So I want you to talk a little bit about sort of like the most important policy wins. Um, you can start with the Nigerian Startup Act and what needs to happen next, um, but what else from a policy perspective and then beyond policy, what needs to happen in infrastructure? What are the things, other things that are critical to you? Um, I would say that, you know, as we mostly all know, we're in a tech, we're in an infrastructure deficit. Um, we're really behind on infrastructure and where we should be to support some of the things um, that we desire to do, AI, a number of other things. Um, we also have the inclusion problem and we have the literacy problem, right? 
Um, I tend to look at all of these as infrastructure because they're all foundational to get us to where we need to get to. Then when you speak to policy, right, policy is supposed to help you because policy statements are an intention of what government intends to do. And we tend to confuse, confuse this with regulation, which is more so what you shouldn't do as a market player. Regulations are, tend to protect and um, guide behavior. So, Nigerian Startup Act is a seed, right? Um, it was planted to help create that enabling environment for startups. Uh, how do you define what an enabling environment is? You know, I've said it so many times that I'm not getting <laughs> disillusioned by the idea of an enabling environment. So when you look at the issues that we have, right, um, a lot of it comes down to, to some extent, a lack of collaboration between the two players, uh, the two big players in the ecosystem, which is policymakers and practitioners. So okay. you participated in the Nigerian Startup Act process, and you saw... We did. Like, we're media. We're supposed to inform on what's happening, but we said this thing was important, and Oswald also dragged us, kicking and screaming, and so we worked on by it. By the ankles. <laughs> so what, what you saw there was that what was important was the collaboration between practitioners, who are the people creating the value, you know, and the policymakers, so you could have a common understanding. So we have a number of policies, a number of acts that need to be done. Let me not take up all the time. You know, Startup Act is just one. In fact, in my head, I'm thinking of 2.0 already, right? All right? And hoping people in this room will take it up, right? Um, we need policies to drive and, 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 and potentially legislature to drive innovation. When you start looking at government and the way government, and this is a global thing, government is somewhat siloed. So to create that cross participation across government, you need legislature, you need policies to be able to drive that. Because when you say innovation, it's going to come from a number of places. In fact, if you look at the ministries being named, two of them have innovation in the, in the title. So these are the things policy aim to drive. Fantastic. And infrastructure? What are the big infrastructure wins from your perspective? <sighs> Just by the way, Oswald is uh, the managing director and founder of a company called Digita. And they just released a white paper last week on a number of sort of key things that need to happen across um, Africa in order to really drive innovation and infrastructure development. So, please. So it was basically it, the, the document is, back, is Nigeria in focus. So okay. we wrote about Nigeria, but it's a reflection to the continent because if you go to anywhere in, Niger in Africa, they'll tell you, ah, Nigeria. If you guys don't get it right, the rest of us won't, right? So you also look at this as a reflection of how to get it done because the problems are exactly the same, just the, the size of it. Um, like I said earlier, we, we're in the infrastructure deficit. Um, the, the issues around infrastructure, you know, cuts across every, almost every single silo. So when it comes to telecoms, as my good doctor just mentioned, there's a deficit in access. Um, and a lot of times when we look at access, we forget about the other side of access, which is just affordability of the devices as a problem, right? Okay. Um, you know, are we learning um, technology in school so we can be able to increase our uh, ability for literacy, in digital literacy? That's, that's also an infrastructural problem. Um, do we have things in place to increase I inclusion? I think there's some stats out there. I hate throwing stats out, but there's stats out there about the, like three to one men to women in the digital space or digital literacy, which is quite bad. Um, you know, so, and what are the, the different areas that we're training in? So, Somebody would say we're over fintech, right? Um, I, I would also argue that, you know, we're also training on the app side a bit much than other areas. So where are the training programs for just chip design? Where are the training programs on infrastructure design? As opposed to every single training is about, you know, app development. So these are all infrastructure issues. It's just not the connectivity, which is weird for me because I'm actually a connectivity person. But I see that those issues about connectivity, they continue to get resolved, and with more investment, they will get resolved as an access. Um, creating the mobile um, uh, industry will solve the, the access problem to affordability. But I think the real kill issue is digital literacy and how we penetrate our education system with those you know, seedlings of a digital understanding. Fantastic. I think that's really critical. I, I very much agree. Julia, I have a question for you around working 
with all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. And so from your perch in Google, you've worked on digital training, you've worked with startups, um, and as an organization where you've had the opportunity uh, to work with a number of different stakeholders. Um, we had Dr. Tijani here, we have one of our own in government, but what's your perspective on what needs to change in the ways in which the tech ecosystem engages with the various players in this thing? And I think an important part is like education. You know, how do we engage with education? How do we engage with government? How do we engage with one another or with enterprise companies to do, to build, to be more productive together? Do you have any perspectives on that from you? Yeah. Absolutely. So. I think um, the, the entire ecosystem needs to come together for us to achieve the scale that we need. At okay. the moment, there's a lot of great work happening. To some degree, you have a lot of that in a silo form, right? And when you think about Nigeria as a population of 200 million, or Africa with a population of 1.2 billion people, even if you, you know, results like maybe 50, training 50,000 people, it sounds like a huge number, but in context, it's just like a drop in the ocean. So it's really important for us to have a lot more collaboration and a lot more partnerships so that our initiatives can really scale, right? And as I mentioned earlier, for us to have a thriving, sustained digital economy, all the different parts are very important and need to grow. So I like um, Oswald's point about, when we think about capacity building, for example, we need to think about our schools, ensuring that our curricula match our aspirations for a sustained tech-enabled economy, right? We need to ensure that the, you know, hundred, the hundred thousands of graduates, no, the millions of graduates that are coming out of our school system are you know, ready for the workforce, ready for a workforce of today, which is in many ways a tech-enabled workforce. So em en ensuring that our curricula are up to date. You know, looking at access, how do we ensure that there are incentives to expand access beyond the urban areas, right? Where you have you know, uh, a, a, a lower hanging fruit in terms of return on investment. If we think about it quite practically, right? Um, there's an expectation that providers would go where they can get more return on investment. So Absolutely. that's why we need more players on the table. We need government to provide incentives to be able to expand access to um, you know, the rural areas, the underserved areas. When we even think about you know, entrepreneurship, we need to ensure that we're creating opportunities where a lot of our very talented, vibrant entrepreneurs can get support. We've celebrated a few unicorns in the continent, but for every unicorn out there, there are probably a thousand more businesses in that space doing great work, right? But they don't have the visibility, they don't have the support that they need. And this is where the ecosystem needs to pull together to provide that level of support. You know, tech hubs, uh, incubators, accelerators. In Nigeria at the moment, actually across Africa, we have about 643 uh, tech hubs and incubators. If you compare that to, to the US, you have uh, over 3,000 uh, incubators. And the UK, which is just about 67 million people, has over 700 tech hubs and incubators. Compare that to a continent of 1.2 billion people. So there's a lot of talent in this market, in this region. I think um, you know, technology offers a great opportunity for us to lead, right? Uh, on the globe, just the way we embraced mobile technologies and have been able to innovate in that space and even set the pace. You know, so some of the advancements we have with mobile payments, for example, are unique to the region and we were a leader when you think globally. In the same way, embracing technology in a big way, you know, technologies like artificial intelligence offer a lot of opportunity for us to solve our basic problems in a much faster way and more cost effectively. When we think about, you know, even education, the fact that, um, you know, the ratio of teachers to students and the challenges around updating our curricula, you know, online learning platforms offer a lot of augmentation to that learning. When we think about healthcare, the fact that we don't have enough doctors, right? Um, the ratio of doctors to patients is, is beyond what it should be. 
uh, you know, innovations like you know, remote diagnostics, telemedicine, et cetera, can really make a huge difference, and so on and so forth. Even FinTech, we can expand beyond payments, credit scoring, blockchain. You know, so there's so much opportunity, and it's just really important for the ecosystem to come together, for us to have more collaboration and partnerships, and for us to think about scale so that we can make a huge difference. Fantastic. Um, Oswald, in terms of what is challenging in the handshake between private sector and government, that engagement, what needs to change? Because you've had a lot of experience in this space recently. What are your thoughts on what, like, I, this, there's some great government people in the, office, in the, in the room. Um, there's a lot of private sector people in the room. What needs to change? Um, earlier, I mentioned the idea of practitioners and policymakers. Um, if you are a practitioner and you want to create an idea, you are in a room somewhere in Lagos or Benin or Delta, and you're creating this idea, and in your mind, this idea is going to disrupt something. It's going to change. It's going to, it's going to cause disruption. Um, disruption is fantastic because a delta happens and then you know, Phoenix rises and something great happens, right? Um, that's what most startups are. And we appreciate it. And everything we've set up here is about supporting that process of disruption to create value. Now, what a policymaker sees I haven't been a policymaker for a couple of months, or a few months. <laughs> <laughs> a few months. Just a, you know. Just, just, a, just a task. Just a um, is you don't see disruption, you see displacement. So something has changed. Because your job as a policymaker or a regulator is to protect what exists. Your job as a practitioner is to break what exists and create new value. So in that is the battle. Yeah. Right? So, um, if you run this little paradigm across any single issue, name it. You know, I don't want to start naming it. Well, I'm a private sector now. Think crypto. Think taxes. <laughs> think, yeah. You know, if before I was, you know, if you run it through that, you'll see that there was a case of something being disrupted and for good from the private sector side, but on the government side, it was causing real displacement. And the only action and tools the government has is to stop action. Ban it. Stop it. Exactly. Don't crypto anymore. Exactly. These people don't want to hear. These people don't want to hear. These people really like no, crypto. I don't. So, <laughs> Am I lying? So the only way to solve that is what Juliet just mentioned, which is collaboration. And interestingly enough, I keep saying this, it's, 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 a, it's a real shame that the Startup Act is almost a year old, and it hasn't been implemented beyond maybe 3%. But what the Act actually offers is a solution for this exact problem. And the benefactors are in this room, both on the public sector and the private sector side. It provides a framework for collaboration between government and private sector to deliver value. Right? It goes through it step by step to ensure that the seed is planted and that seed is guided to a growth where it can actually fly off on its own. So we also need, and I, I'm, a, I'm a private citizen, so I, I'm, it's okay for me to point fingers at private fellow private citizens, we also need to stop the sense of apathy when it comes to governance. We are all the government, right? Everybody here could be appointed something tomorrow and you become government. What do you now say, <laughs> right? I was sitting in my house during COVID when I got my call, right? And I remember sitting in the friend's, your house actually, when I said, did I just cross an imaginary line? And, and, when, you, and when you get asked, like if you get asked, it's hard to say no. You've been asked to serve. You, you say, can that. say no. <laughs> In fact, I may start advising people to say no. No, I'm kidding. Do it is a great experience. <laughs> you learn. I experience. mean, you know, you learn. You learn a few things. You, you, you learn <laughs> almost everything. So I think that's. I think that's really critical. I think that's an important. It's an important interplay that we have to acknowledge, um, because we do. I think for a lot of people in the private sector, be like, yeah, those government people over there, they just leave us alone, let's do our thing over here. And I think having worked uh, with Oswald on the Startup Act and having engaged with government in a number of ways, the idea that we are government is a real one. We determine how the country works and the gap between us and them is a lot smaller than it might initially uh, seem. Juliet, in terms of the next sort of 
we've had a lot of growth over the last decade, over the last 15 years, 25 years of technology. What do you see as like the big challenges, the big risks over the next sort of like growth period for us? Yes, thank you. So when I look out into the future, there are a few things that come to mind. The first, I wouldn't say too much about because it goes back to everything we're saying about infrastructure and the things that need to be in place. We've been talking about the next billion users for probably about a decade now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's been a big part of my life for a while, saying that we need to enable the next billion users to come online. And those next billion would come largely from emerging markets like African markets. Um, we haven't made as much progress as um, we would like to see. And so one risk is that we don't move fast enough, right? And we get left behind because development, you know, the pace of change is accelerating around the world. I often say that, you know, digital literacy today is what basic literacy was to society decades ago. It's the starting point. It's the level playing field. So, so that's one risk that we move too slowly. We don't really pull together in a, a scalable manner and in a sustained way to uh, generate the results that are required. But also, the other side of that, we have very smart people on the continent, right? They will find the solutions, they will figure it out, right? And we run the risk of having, you know, you mentioned Jakba earlier, yes. right? So we run the risk of people um, enabling themselves, but then, you know, uh, exiting, finding opportunities elsewhere, um, you know, going to platforms like Fiverr and so on, and we lose a lot more talent because, you know, as, as talent becomes more digitally savvy, it also becomes more dynamic, more mobile, right? Absolutely. So that's another risk that we uh, lose a lot of our, you know, young and vibrant talent as they figure it out for themselves. But certainly my hope, right, uh, in all of that is that, you know, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of great talent on the continent and technology offers great opportunities for, um, you know, game-changing opportunities and a level playing field, right? And, you know, if we really come together, it's important to ensure that our young people are not left behind, that they are able to participate in the digital economy, that they have the training, the skills, the tools, the support, you know, funding, financing, uh, mentorship, um, you know, infrastructure access from a perspective of availability and affordability, right? Um, and we're able to see a lot more, you know, entrepreneurial growth beyond the low-hanging fruit, right? To sectors where, where there's a huge need, uh, providing the funding support, uh, support for risk-taking as well, so that we can drive more innovation um, in the space. So, you know, I think, and I, you know, just to close on that, I think artificial intelligence, this is an area where we can, the way we leapfrogged with um, the, the mobile, mobile technologies, this is an area where we can leapfrog and put Africa front and center, right? And it accelerates development in our spaces because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our challenges can be solved a lot more easily and cost effectively with AI. So my hope is that, you know, as we look forward, um, we would be able to lean more into these emerging technologies and you know the uh, ecosystem would come together to be able to drive this growth. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. I think that's really, really critical. Oswald, I want to talk about just funding. A large chunk of our funding comes from foreign investors. I mean, not a large chunk, it's a huge chunk of our funding. And shout out to all the investors from across the world and across the continent who are here today. Um, we appreciate you. But how do we develop more infrastructure for funding in terms of local capital? Like what things need to happen on that front? So I think we'll look at that from, from the issue of why, why is the funding here but not here? Right? And that's to mean that we are getting foreign funding, but the foreign funding, as we say, not the touch ground. It's not really in yeah, Nigeria. Yeah, because it's sitting in Delaware. Yeah. So for those who don't know, like a lot of your technology companies, you know, they might have a Nigerian entity, but the majority of their money is sitting there in a the Delaware account. All of the money is sitting there. <laughs> There's no Nigerian bank who is claiming to have gotten any of these hits of any of this. So we're not feeling the real impact of the funding that we are celebrating, right? 
So um, I think, you know, part of the issue is the lack of case law and the lack of a strong patent regiment, right? And the lack of policies that incentivize funding, right? So that's some of the stuff we try to address in the Startup Act, right? We saw that even local funders weren't were more so punished as opposed to celebrated to invest locally. So you now need to, put, because there's a lack of incentive, right? What is the tax benefit for my, my, my funding? So you have to introduce tax benefits to increase local participation. And there's also a bit of lack of um, uh, trust in the entire ecosystem mm. to, to invest locally here. You know, it's more so, and it's more so it, you're all sort of sitting in the same room and the potential of what you're trying to do may only be seen by people far away. That's also an issue. But, but I think on, the, on what we can fix directly is to increase through policy and legislature incentives to drive local um, funding. Also incentives to drive investment or exits through the stock exchange, right? Okay, yeah. Um, I often give the, the, um, the example of Paystack. I know the guys, I love the idea, I love what happened. But I would have much rather if the exit on Paystack happened first via the NGX, for instance, because the impact of that sale would have been felt a bit more broadly, right? So in most of the IPOs you hear in the States that actually impact the economy, they, they, they're rushing the list on the NASDAQ, right? Yep. And that's how most startups you know, get liquidated and the founders get you know, wealthy and, and more people get wealthy because they believed in the idea, not just the fact that they had a seed round participation or, or Series A yeah, participation. Yeah, the exit is where the wealth actually yes. gets shared. Exactly, so if you bought Facebook in 2007, you know, yeah, you're a very happy man now. You use helicopter. you be using helicopter and VI. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just to get around. So, but but I, but I think it's about really giving that incentive. I mean, the I mean, you know, Juliet has mentioned a number of things that shows the fact that Nigeria and Africa has so much potential, right? So it's obvious that when you stand outside and look at it, or if you first visit Nigeria, it's at the airports you smell the potential. Right. Is that the airport you go, wow. It's I mean, not a few other things as well. But, no, sure, uh, but if, you, <laughs> if you're entrepreneur-minded, you see from the airport, you know, like me, I tell people all the time, just give me the airport. Yeah. I've said that to you, yeah. right? So it's from the airport that your entrepreneurial, that this place has a lot of possibilities. You know, there, there are really three things you should look at to know why uh, investments are happening, right? One, we have very young people who are very intelligent, can be trained, and we have them Plenty, all right? We have real problems that need to be solved. Yep. There are real problems that you can use a digital solution to solve. There are plenty, right? Left, right. I mean, there was a solution when I was in the State House that I heard about some girls up north doing like Uber for water. Now, sitting in Lagos, you're saying water. Okay, if you're in Lekki, maybe you understand that problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow, as well. But, well, it's <laughs> truth. I mean, He's not lying. <laughs> I mean, you have to speak the truth. But Uber for water, water is, is a solution, right? It's a local solution. And the last bit is that we have large, a large market where you can test those ideas, right? Correct. So if you take those three components together, it's massive opportunity. It's just really about getting all these pillars in place, the training, the found, get all those foundations in place to help us moonshot, right? Fantastic. Right. So you're bringing us to my final question. This is a conference called Moonshot. The minister has bid us to be bold and audacious. From your perspective, what is it really, I mean, like, for this audience, what should they know? What should they do? What, what, is, what are the boldest initiatives you want to see them do? What kind of thinking do you want to see? Just kind of a, as a final sort of closing round, what should the boldest thinkers, innovators, doers in this ecosystem be doing? What do you want to see from them? And I want both of you to answer it. So Juliet first, and then also. Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll mention it in two categories. So I think it's, it's so, because um, we talked about the talent that exists and, um, you know, one of the things that um, I, I work on at the moment is supporting tech entrepreneurs. I, we just started a, a cohort of a fellowship uh, on Saturday and it Beyond was just limits. great. Beyond limits, yes. And it was just great to see some of the innovations coming through. We've been talking about infrastructure and access, the fact that we need, it needs to be more affordable, more available, et cetera. 
And it was great to see some startups innovating around using software to reduce data costs. Um, and you have a lot of uh, such innovation. So, you know, my first thing is the fact that, you know, let's all lean in, use the tools that are available, and see how we can solve local problems. If you have that idea, you know, on the flip side of every challenge is opportunity. And we don't have a shortage of challenges on the continent, like the airport, like you, like you mentioned. <laughs> on the flip side of that Underwater. is opportunity. And so, you know, let's uh, be inspired as we look at, at these challenges, be bold, in you know, stepping out to say, I'm going to create this, I've started this, it, it has the potential to be this big, and I'm going to look at um, ways I can get the right level of support, and then to take action, to really step into you know, the ecosystem, to forums like this, um, and um, the various resources and um, platforms that are available to be able to get there. So that's one thing in terms of just personal charge, but also, more broadly, as, as a moonshot, I would really like to see Nigeria embrace business process outsourcing in a big way. Because we're talking about training people at scale. After training these people, what next? We need to ensure that there are jobs for them to be gainfully employed. And we are sitting on a gold mine that we're not using. You know, when you think about the global out, business process outsourced market, which countries like India, Indonesia have been tapping into for years. It's billions of dollars, and we have a lot of things in our favor. We have time zones in our favor. The fact that our first language, you know, for the most part is English, or at least our, our training and work language is English, you know? So we have, and we have the labor and manpower and the exposure. So as part of the strategy to create you know, a million jobs, right? I would really want to see outsource uh, um, a BPO front and center. Um, and I've seen a, a couple of organizations that are actually doing this in Nigeria. Uh, last week I was in Abuja and I visited an, an office of, um, you know, a, a, a lady that actually has 1,300 seats servicing US companies from Abuja, you know? I love it. And it's, it's not just call center work. They're doing legal work, they're doing accounting, so they're even already moving up the value chain. You know, there's no reason why, and I know I need to round up, there's no reason why we can't really, um, you know, create the enable, enabling environment for this to grow. Government has a big role to play because perception is important. Absolutely. If the narrative about Nigeria out there is that, Absolutely. you know, corruption, crime, safety, all kinds of things, people won't have the trust and the confidence to bring their businesses uh, over here. Fantastic. Um, people, this is business. I think that's, like, that's an amazing opportunity. Like, that company sounds amazing. Don't mention their name, don't give them free advertising, but you know, <laughs> I might copy the idea. Oswald, what are your moonshot ideas? Should I not mention the name? <laughs> <laughs> Pay me. That's business. So I would say audacious, sagacious, collaboration, practical. Um, be bold, enter this market. You're sitting on the largest growing, fastest growing market in the world. It may not look like it, but you all have a stake in it and you have taken a position. Maintain that position and be bold about it with your ideas. Sagacious, hey, if you haven't downloaded my white paper. We need knowledge, people. You can read all these documents. So there's policy, I mean, I think a really important thing the is. The document, yeah. is a clear reflection of where Nigeria is. Um, I tell the story that when I joined government, I had nothing to read that was written by us. So on my exit from government, the first thing I did was write something that the next person can read. So download the white paper. Digital.Africa. Digital.Africa. Um, collaboration. It's important to collaborate with government. Let's stop with the apathy. You are the government, right? Um, I tell people all the time, I think no time like now have we been really close to federal government, as in everybody here knows somebody that was appointed. We're all getting to that age where two of our friends uh, were I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a baby boy. Uh, your Aburo is appointed. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you have Aburo's are appointed. And then when we think of practical, right, you know, I say this all the time, um, martial arts, and I'll leave on this, martial arts 
you know, we all know it starts in Asia. Um, that they, they own it. It's not ours. And um, our NYSC, we are still focused on learning martial arts as part of the core activities that they do. It's a paramilitary organization. The rest of the world understands that the battlefield has moved. The battlefield is now digital. So the Asians that own martial arts, they are teaching their children digital at a very, very young age. We are still doing martial arts in our somewhat post-university years when we should be using that one year to do sort of a digital finishing school, for instance. So practical ideas. So if you have an opportunity to influence government, it's just the practical ideas that really make the change. Nigerian Startup Act was a simple, practical idea. It's not complicated. It's just prose on the paper that says, this is what we need to do to, to have an ecosystem that works for us all. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Can we give a warm round of applause to Dr. Juliet A. Union and Oswald Sarah Ting Gorbadia. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe, I don't know if we're doing a picture. We'll do that upstairs. But thank you very much, everyone. Please.